So today we're going to move on to a concept called mass spectrometers. These are actually quite useful devices. I'll explain what they are in just a moment. So we're going to learn about a device called, or, or sorry, that can be used to separate matter based on its isotope today called a mass spectrometer. Uh, so in other words, we've talked before about isotopes being the same element, but with just a different number of neutrons to it. We're going to talk today about how to separate and organize them. Uh, we'll look at what formulas apply to mass spectrometers. Uh, thankfully, it's nothing new. All of the formulas that apply are going to be formulas we've seen before. Um, but unfortunately with this, there's going to be a lot of stitching formulas together here. We're going to have a bunch of different formulas, many of which you wouldn't necessarily expect to come into play, uh, that will come into play. And I'll show you with a couple examples that are both uh, quite long, but you will want to be jotting these down. Uh, we'll walk through a couple examples, like I just said, and then of course, practice time today. Not a huge amount of new content, uh, but it's going to be those practice questions that, can, that are going to take us the uh, most amount of time. Anyway, here we go. So a mass spectrometer. A mass spectrometer is an instrument that separates particles according to their charge to mass ratio. Therefore, a mass spectrometer is able to distinguish and separate isotopes. Um, because, of course, isotopes have different amounts of neutrons to them. Neutrons add nothing to the charge, um, but they do add some to the mass. That would therefore change the charge to mass ratio of a particle. So a basic mass spectrometer uses a four-stage process. The first stage is ionization. The sample is vaporized and ionized. In other words, it's given a charge. Uh, it's accelerated, so they're in acceleration phase, phase, which is done with high voltage plates, of course. Uh, then they use velocity selection. Uh, this happens, this is the most like complicated part of it, but it happens by crossing electric and magnetic fields so that only particles moving at a specific velocity pass through. Uh, again, remember we've learned before when you have perpendicular electric and magnetic fields that if you are going too slow, you're going to go to one side. If you go too fast, you're going to go to another side. So only particles going at a certain velocity are going to be able to pass through that section. Uh, and then there's the detection phase where the current detected in the detector chamber where the ions move in circular paths uh, and therefore can be measured, right? So in other words, that's how we actually detect what we've got going on. Uh, here's a diagram kind of how it works. You can have a look at that if you wish, but uh, during ionization, neutral particles become ionized in order for them to respond to electric and magnetic fields. Of course, ionized again, like I said before, just as given a charge, basically. A potential difference created by high voltage plates is then used to accelerate a beam of the, a beam of the ions into the velocitor selector region. Uh, and again, the velocitor, velocity selector region, of course, is between uh, two parallel electric and magnetic fields. Anyway, moving on. So the purpose of the velocity selector is to ensure all the ions entering the detecting chamber have the same speed. It is composed of uniform magnetic and electrical fields that are perpendicular to each other. The speed of the ions that are undeflected through the field is this. V equals the electric field strength divided by the magnetic field strength. Uh, and in case you're wondering where I got that from, because we don't give this formula to you directly, this just comes from setting Fe equals Fm and then crossing out everything that's the same and getting velocity all by itself. I won't walk through it again for you. I'm sure you can do it on your own. Um, but just understand that that velocity uh, is your electric field strength divided by your magnetic field strength. And since you're controlling both of those, you should be able to control, therefore, what that velocity would be. Now, the detection chamber consists of a magnetic field which deflects the charged particles in a circular path. The mass of the charged particles can then be calculated by equating the magnetic force and the centripetal force, as of course they would. If the only uh, kind of field you have going on in here is a magnetic field, and you're seeing that it's moving in a circular path, we know that Fm is equal to Fc. Uh, in other words, the formula for Fm for at least a single particle is QVB, and Fc is mv squared over r. You can cross out the v's on both sides, and you can get QB equals mv over r. In this formula for the radius of deflection, the velocity charge and magnetic field strength are all constant. Therefore, the radius is proportional to the particle's mass. Uh, basically, what that means is you controlled your velocity by uh, selecting it in your velocity selector. You controlled your magnetic field strength because that's, of course, part of your mass spectrometer in the first place. So you should have control over that. Uh, and uh, sorry, uh, the velocity, the, oh, and the charge, of course. Yeah, and the charge. You charged it in the ion and the ionization process, right? So, in other words, you should know this, you should know this, and you should know this. Uh, so, in other words, your mass and your radius are the only thing that are, are proportional to each other because that's the only thing left over that you haven't actually controlled. Okay, moving on. So uh, the rest of today is just going to be a couple examples, and you can already see example slide one of two. Uh, this is going to be a lot of work. There's going to be a lot of stuff to this, but make sure you're following along with this and understanding each process. And of course, you can go back if you're not understanding. A uh, positively charged uh, carbon-14 ion, uh, so a carbon-14 ion with a positive elementary charge was accelerated from rest 
through a potential difference of 1.66 times 10 to the 4 volts. The ion then enters a region where there is a perpendicular magnetic field with a strength of 3.20 times 10 to the negative 2 Teslas. Determine the radius of the ion's path through the detection region. Uh, so let's break this down. There's a lot of stuff. It's hard to even tell where we're going with this. Oftentimes, I like starting with the end in mind. So let's say we're determining the radius of the ion's path through the detection region. That's going to be a circular radius, so we know that Fm is going to equal Fc. Or in other words, as we've seen from the more simplified formula, Qb equals mv over r. Uh, now, one thing we know here is we know B. We know that magnetic field strength. Um, but we really don't know much else going on here. Um, yeah, we, like, we really have a lot of work to do here. Uh, before we can find R, we're, we're going to need to know the velocity. We should also know the mass. So we, we, yeah, we're going to have quite a bit. Uh, yeah, we're going to have a bit of work to do here. Um, oh, wait, Q. We know Q as well because it's a positive elementary charge. Elementary charge, of course, is that uh, 1.60 uh, times 10 to the negative 19. But anyway, we'll, we'll get back to that in a second. So since we have to find that velocity, for one thing, uh, we need to figure out what that velocity is going to be. Well, remember, the velocity is created from uh, the acceleration phase. And the acceleration is going to be uh, caused, of course, uh, by this potential difference of 1.66 times 10 to the 4 volts. So we know an amount of volts, uh, but we need to find a velocity out of this. If you look in your formula sheet, there's a couple different formulas for voltage. But the one that's going to be useful here is the one that says delta V, so your voltage, is delta E over Q. Delta E is your change in energy. We can assume that this is starting, oh, not even assume, it tells us, it's starting from rest. So our delta E is going to be our final kinetic energy in this case. We know our voltage, we know our Q, because Q, of course, is your elementary charge. So therefore, we can say that delta E is equal to delta V times Q, or in other words, delta E is going to equal your, uh, your voltage, so 1.66 times 10 to the 4 times by your Q, which is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. And again, I know that this is the Q because it was told, we were told that it was a positive elementary charge, so only one elementary charge to it. This is going to give me my change in energy is equal to 2.656 times 10 to the negative 15 joules. Now that's entirely kinetic energy, right? Because we went from rest to this. Uh, so in other words, this has to be kinetic energy. So we know that EK, kinetic energy, is one half mv squared. Uh, now, we kind of run into another snag here. We now know our kinetic energy. We'd like to find our, our velocity, but here now we need to know our mass. So we don't really have much choice. We've got to find that mass. Well, to find that mass, we can actually use the fact that we know it's a carbon-14 ion. Carbon-14 is carbon with a 14 right here, uh, and then the atomic number on carbon, which is six just down here. Uh, what this means is we have six protons, and therefore, 14 minus 6 is 8 neutrons. Now, at least in terms of physics 30, we can say that protons and neutrons have the exact same mass. So I didn't even need to split it apart here. We have 14 of them in total. Uh, and that same mass is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. That's on your formula sheet. So if we're going to find our mass, we might as well say it's 14 times the, uh, the mass of uh, an individual proton or an individual neutron, which again is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. What this gives us is our mass is equal to about 2.338 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. Whew, see I kind of told you there's a lot to it. We're just kind of chipping away at this. Uh, if we're going to just take a step back here for a second and like look at the whole big picture, remember I started with the end in mind. I want to find that radius. In order to find that radius, I have to know all these other things. We only knew Q and we only knew B. So that tells us we need to find M and V. I found M, didn't even need to do all this first. We found M, now we gotta find that V, finally. Uh, so V is gonna come out of our EK formula. EK is 2.656 times 10 to the negative 15, as we calculated earlier. That equals 1 half times M, which is 2.338 times 10 to the negative 26 times by V squared. Hopefully you know how to do this now. Just divide by 1 half, divide by this, and then square root. You should find that V is equal to, and I'm actually going to write out the whole number, 467657.883 meters per second. So I guess that's 476,657.883 meters per second. Uh, and now finally, 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 we can come back to this equation we started with in the beginning. We know Q, we know B, we know M, we know V. 
we can finally find R. Holy smokes, this took absolutely forever. So I'm gonna use this formula, I just put a box around here. Q is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 27, or sorry, not negative 27, I'm mixing that up with mass, my mistakes, uh, times 10 to the negative 19, my apologies, times by your B value, so that's your strength, your magnetic field, well that's 3.20 times 10 to the negative two, question gave that to us. Set that equal to your mass, which is 2.338 times 10 to the negative 26, times by V, which is that horrible number I wrote down before, 4766657.883, and then divided by R. Uh, I'm gonna save you the whole trouble of rearranging this, plus we're out of room, although I did have a slide two. I didn't even end up needing my slide two, so I put it in just because I was being careful. Anyway, calculating this is gonna give us R equals 2.18, because we needed three sig digs here, and that's gonna be measured in meters. So the radius of that ion's path through that detection chamber is 2.18 meters. So hopefully it's a pretty big detection chamber because uh, otherwise that's a pretty large radius, okay? All right, hopefully that made some sense here. Again, uh, if it didn't, make sure you, you go back and have another look through it. The whole bottom line is start with that end in mind, connect your formulas appropriately and think critically about where you're gonna find different things from. Probably the hardest part about this was understanding that this velocity that was missing has gotta come out of our energy. Uh, and the only thing that we can use to relate our uh, voltage to our energy is this formula right here. Hopefully that helps. All right, moving on, next example. Uh, doubly charged sodium ions with an unknown mass pass undeflected through the velocity selector of a mass spectrometer. The velocity selector has perpendicular magnetic and electric fields with strengths of that and that respectively. Uh, that's an electric field, of course, so that's E with the arrow. Maybe I'll even just write that on there right now. Uh, once the ions enter the ion separation region, they are deflected through a radius of five centimeters by a magnetic field of 1.22 Teslas. Keep in mind, this magnetic field is in that, uh, that detection chamber, right? Uh, they're not in the, in the uh, velocity selector chamber, so we have a second magnetic field for a reason. We'll have to use that one appropriately. Determine which element isotope this is and write it as AZX, okay, in this, this old format that we learned last class. Holy smokes. Okay, so there's a lot to break down on this one. Once again, just kind of start writing what you know and think about what you want in the end. Very first thing, just because it's bugging me up here, it says doubly charged. What that just means is you have two elementary charges, right? So two times an elementary charge uh, tells us right now that we're going to have a charge of 3.20 times 10 to the negative 19. So I just took that 1.60 and I multiplied it by two. Okay, so that's going to be our charge. Uh, we want to find what element it is, but we know the element, it, it's like it's sodium, right? But we just want to find what isotope it is. So really what we're doing is we're just trying to figure out um, the number of neutrons. Uh, sodium, first of all, if you look at your formula sheet, sodium is kind of up in the top left-hand corner. Sodium is Na, and it has 11, yeah, 11 protons. And it gives us an atomic mass number, but again, that can change because we might have a different isotope of sodium. So that 22.99 is an atomic mass number that we see in our formula sheet. We can't just use that because that's making an assumption that we have just plain regular sodium and not some different isotope of sodium. But we can make the total, not even an assumption, the valid claim that sodium has 11 protons because that's a fact. Sodium always has 11 protons. If it didn't have 11 protons, it wouldn't be sodium. Um, Let's break this down into steps then. Since we're looking for the element isotope, we're ultimately gonna be looking for the mass. Um, and unfortunately, that mass is gonna to have to be uh, determined in that detection region with this magnetic field. Before we even get there, we need to figure out what our velocity is going to be. Uh, and that velocity is gonna come out of the velocity selector region, which comes from these guys right here. Now remember, in the velocity selector region, just write it out here, in the velocity selector region, what we have to do is we have to set our, um, our force electric equal to our force magnetic. Um, now, if you were to do that and you were to write out the whole formulas, you'd be able to rearrange it and get exactly what we want. I mentioned it very briefly earlier and I said, oh, I'm not gonna show you how to do it. Basically, just because I can remember it, I'm gonna save you the trouble. I'll write it out though, Fe equals Fm. But to save you the trouble, I just know that my velocity is gonna equal my electric field strength divided by my magnetic field strength. That's all there is to it. If you know what your electric field strength is and your magnetic field strength, you can find what velocity those particles are gonna be flying through there at. Uh, so this is gonna tell us that V is going to equal my electric field strength, and again, that's in the velocity selector. That's 4.00 times 10 to the five. 
uh, and then divide it by my electric field strength in the velocity selector. So that's this guy right here, 0 0.820. And that's going to give us uh, 487804.878 meters per second. Notice how I don't round these, by the way. I didn't, never mentioned in the last question we did. Don't round until the very end. I've seen before some people that just round early on. Don't do that. That's why I write these crazy numbers out because I want my exact numbers before I get my final answer. So that's the velocity that those particles are going to come out at. Uh, then they're going to enter that uh, detection chamber. And in the detection chamber, uh, so I'll call it detection. In the detection chamber, what we have is we have our Fm, our magnetic force, equals to our centripetal force. Or in other words, Qb equals mv over r. We want to find m because m is going to help us find what isotope this is. Let's think about what we have here. Do we have Q? Yep, we have Q. It was doubly charged. We have B. That's in this one, so that's 1.22. We don't have M, but that's what we're looking for. We found our V. That's what we found from the velocity selector. And then R, we do have R. It's our five centimeters, right? So we'll just have to turn that to meters. In other words, we're good to go on this one. Q is 3.20 times 10 to the negative 19. B is 1.22. M is our unknown. Uh, v is 487804.878, and divide that by our radius, which is 0 0.05 meters. Let's uh, calculate all this, multiply this over, and then divide the 487804, blah, 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 over on, and we find that m is equal to 4.0016 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. All right, so that's our mass, right? That's the mass of our particle. Not a very big mass, as you can see. Um, but what the mass really is representing here is it's the mass of the nucleons uh, that are existing in this particle itself. So if we divide by what each nucleon's mass is, so in other words, the mass of either a proton or a neutron, we'll know how many we had in total. Uh, just because I'm running out of room here, I'm going to write this to, or take this to the next slide here. So I'll just rewrite my mass. Mass, once again, is 4.0016 times, ooh, I'm kind of drifting there, 4.0016 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. If we divide this by the mass of a single proton or a single neutron, in other words, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27, that's going to tell us how many there are. When I divide this, it's going to give me a decimal number, but we can round to the nearest one to get 24. So we have 24 nucleons. In other words, 24 protons slash neutrons. Um, and now we can start piecing together what the element isotope is. Uh, remember, isotope is determined by your number of neutrons that you have. Uh, so what we can do is we can recognize that we once again had sodium. So sodium had 11 protons. So 11 protons. But we know we have 24 nucleons in total. 24 minus 11 gives us 13 neutrons. Right? So if we're going to write this now as, uh, as an element isotope in this form, we can say it's Na with an 11 down here for your number of protons and 24 up here. That would be our isotope. It's going to be sodium with 13 neutrons, or in other words, 24 nucleons in total. And I think that's all the question wanted. Yeah, that is all the question wanted. So a really bizarre question, as you can see. There, there's a lot going on with these ones. Um, they are, they are quite challenging, they're quite a puzzle. I might have made that look easy and I know it's probably a lot harder uh, to you guys, but just remember, break it down into phases. Look for what you're wanting in the end, right? So think about what you've got and what you're wanting and understand that in a mass spectrometer, uh, the most important steps, at least as far as I'm concerned, are your velocity selector and your detection. And just remember in the velocity selector, yes, you have to say that Fe equals Fm, or in other words, you might as well say, that's Fe, by the way, Fe equals Fm, or in other words, you might as well just say that your velocity is equal to your electric field strength divided by your magnetic field strength. And then in your detection, in the detection chamber, you have Fm equals to Fc, because that's where it starts going in a radius. Hopefully that helped uh, for practice. And yes, you, as you clearly can see, are gonna want to do this practice. Uh, isotopes and mass spectrometer worksheet, page 35 to 37. Page 35 should already be done. That was what you were asked to do the last day. Uh, so really it's just page 36 and 37. And then of course the atomic physics assignment, as always keep plugging away at that, even though it's not due for quite some time. Uh, as always, please make sure you're reaching out to me if you have any questions. Uh, and I'm more than willing to, to give you some help, even if you just send me a photo or whatever you're stuck on. Best of luck guys.